Welcome to BA Bootcamp. My name is Luc Vermaas and together with Gert Zwedek, we ensure that you stay informed of the latest developments in the field of business analysis. We combine different theoretical approaches with our extensive practical experience from the field so that you immediately leave our sessions with tangible tips and ideas to put in practice in your daily work. Have fun watching and if you want to be staying informed in our latest videos, follow us on YouTube. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome again back for our seventh episode of the Babok Untangled series. So uh, still two more to go. Uh, so we're kind of uh, reaching the end there, uh, almost covering 400 pages of content, uh, which we now kind of uh, brought back to, what is it, nine hours of content uh, we did right now. Um, so yeah, very, very welcome to have you again here, uh, either online or, uh, or, or virtually in this uh, live episode. Today we're going to talk about requirements life cycle management. Um, probably the word life cycle, uh, you hear in a lot of terms, customer life cycle, contract life cycle. So there's a, a lot of ways to describe life cycle. Well, basically it's the very same, but then today it's all about requirements because requirements could have different stages uh, from the moment you gather a requirements uh, up until the moment that it's actually prioritized, put on uh, the um, uh, sprint or you know the way how you develop uh, and, and really put it in um, into development uh, that, that goes through various stages. And today we really want to talk about, uh, I think a topic that is uh, maybe, you know, not, not always used in, in, in the best ways. And we want to give you the best practices and ideas how you could use uh, which techniques uh, for what circumstances during the requirements lifecycle management uh, phase. So just to uh, give a quick brief overview, uh, where are we today? Uh, as said, we are at episode seven, still two to go. So uh, we're going to touch solution evaluation. Uh, so really talking about uh, the end result or the end, uh, uh, let's say a product that has been built or uh, an, an, an outcome that has been, um, uh, uh, you know, realized, how do you then actually evaluate whether that solution, that outcome actually fit, ha, fits the needs that you ultimately set at the beginning of your, uh, of your project. And then as a last uh, point, we're going to talk about business analysis competencies, which is also uh important because it more talks about the who of the business analyst rather than the what uh but then again we do believe firmly that also the mindset and the kind of the the competences you need as a ba will help in uh you know being successful rather than just only understanding the theoretics the theoretical part of um have what tasks do you need to perform uh, but it's very much involved with people therefore you as a business analyst you know, need to also be able to adjust. Uh, but that is the last episode we will do today. Requirements lifecycle management. So to see where we are in the picture, uh, we're checking the boxes. We are almost at the end. And today we're really going to focusing on requirements lifecycle management. So what is requirements lifecycle management? What, what tasks do you typically have as a business analyst? um when you are you know part of this uh of, of, of you know these 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 activities so first of all we're talking about tracing requirements tracing requirements uh, so so uh, i think mm, i don't know uh about you Gert, but i see this topic often forgotten yeah it's true yeah how do relate how do requirements relate to each other so a very important topic i think Exactly. So, uh, I mean, uh, maybe if, if it's a small project, it's quite easy, but think about larger projects where maybe multiple BAs are working, multiple stakeholders, different departments, business units. How do you actually manage that these requirements go back to the original plan and objectives you have set at the beginning of your project? Yeah, so that's important. But then also over course of time, over the course of the project where you get a requirements, how do you actually maintain them? And in terms of main maintenance of requirements we really mean are you updating them according the changes that are there uh, maybe you spoke to stakeholder um, uh, a uh, two weeks back you spoke to stakeholder b and then you think hmm, may maybe i have to go back to stakeholder a to kind of see is that really what is indeed uh, a consensus here and then maybe a might adjust their requirement to fit more towards b and then you know how do you then keep track of all those changes 
Uh, then we are coming to a very important point, and I think is one of the most critical nowadays, knowing that uh, you know we want to gain speed in our product development. Uh, we want to do things quickly with the highest possible outcome and value. So therefore, prioritization is very important. Uh, how do you do that? How do you make sure that you prioritize the right requirements? We will talk about that. Assess requirements changes. Are the changes actually you know, still adding up to the ultimate objective that you're trying to reach or the, uh, of the, of the design that you want to try to achieve? And then uh, lastly, approve requirements. Uh, how do you actually make sure that everybody is OK and aligned and that these are the requirements we want to go uh, either, you know, put into the next sprint or, you know, are part of the project, yes or no, on the must have and nice to have list. Yeah, so we will talk about uh, that as well. Plus, uh, maybe also talk about how does it fit in our traditional project work. So maybe, Gert, you can elaborate yeah. a little bit about this. Uh, yeah, now we've, we've shown you this picture before. Um, this is, yeah, like waterfall-esque kind of working uh, in which you have a project, uh, you have some pre-project work and you have some post-project work and during the delivery you're mainly concentrated on requirement analysis and design definition. So uh, specifying and modeling your requirements, making sure these are being verified and valid validated. Uh, that was the, the topic of the last episode. Um, and before you can do that, you have to do some strategy analysis, as you can see. So that's where it often starts with uh, some kind of strategy analysis. What's going on in the organization? What needs to be done? What's the change? What's the solution? Um, and you uh, elaborate these by uh, making sure you have the proper uh, requirements specified and modeled. Um, as you can see in traditional projects, this is being done during the project. Um, the, the requirement lifecycle management uh, knowledge area uh, starts uh, at the beginning uh, and it ends at the end of a project, as you can see. So um, the, the, the business needs, the business requirements you will find during your strategy analysis that's where your life cycle management actually starts. So that's where you start managing your requirements. Um, and during the uh, implementation, you start having more like stakeholder requirements and solution requirements. And these need to be updated as long as the project lasts. And even after the project, you will keep on um, maintaining your requirements because your solution will be there for a while, right? So a project is typically uh, used to develop some kind of product and after the, uh, the development, you will deploy it. And of course, even then there will be some new um, adjustments to the software. So that's why the requirement lifecycle management keeps on going. So not just during your project, but also after your project project when you start using the product. And this is also true for Agile. So what's so typical about Agile? Uh, this is the picture from the, the Agile extension to the Babok. Uh, you have three levels, the strategy level, the initiative level, and the delivery level. So suppose you use Scrum. Uh, Scrum is all about delivery. Um, and of course, uh, a project you can say, well, that's that's more like an initiative level. So you have three levels. The initiative level is the the link between the strategy you have, the things you think of during your strategy analysis, and the delivery. And the, the main difference uh, with the waterfall, the traditional kind of working, is that you have iteration. So you have feedback loops, not just within the level strategy, initiative, and delivery, but also between delivery and initiative, and between initiative and strategy. So this means you learn as you go. You have some uh, thoughts uh, at uh, strategy level, you may start some initiative, some project in which you, um, well, start building a new product, for instance, 
and the delivery lev level will deliver the product. Um, and of course, there needs to be an alignment between these levels as well, between strategy level, the things you have uh, with your business requirements, your stakeholder requirements, and your solution requirements you implement at delivery. So, and also we're going to have a look at that later with uh, uh, traceability. You will have, um, well, the alignment between what you actually deliver and what is, um, well, uh, important at a higher level. So requirement lifecycle management, remember that that's the a big difference between the, the, the requirement analysis and design definition. Uh, this is all about maintenance uh, management of the requirements you you have found during your your um, elicitation and you have specified and modeled and here you might you want to make sure uh, every everything is well with all these requirements exactly and i think the most common uh, where a lot of people probably can recognize this is that when you work with jira uh, which we will touch about also later in the techniques but you have this endless list of user stories, um, but indeed, who is actually maintaining them? Is it the product owner? Is it the business analyst? Is it the uh, who, who are actually maintaining, making sure that they are up to date on par? I think uh, as a business analyst, you're definitely a part in that, but it's also often quite difficult as uh, you have a list of, I don't know, 200, 200 user stories that you might get lost, like, oh, how the hell am I gonna do, you know, manage this? Uh, so it's also about, uh, uh, having a system in place for yourself, um, how to keep track of the changes, what statuses would you work with. Uh, so, I mean, in the end, let also tools help you in supporting uh, your requirements lifecycle management, but that uh, will be also shown uh, later. Yeah, this is an important slide, I think. Um, there's no fixed order to requirement lifecycle management. As you can see, <clears throat> There's uh, input requirements, designs, uh, changes to requirements, and uh, in some occasions you need verified requirements, and these are all your input for uh, these tasks you can see here. Um, again, there's no fixed order, so actually we're going to have another order than just doing from 5.1 to 5.5. We will start with the approval of requirements. Yeah. So I will um, express that later again. Uh, there is no fixed order to requirement lifecycle management. It just depends on what you want to do, on what you need to do. Uh, here you see 5.5 um, approve requirements. Uh, and we have started with this one to make sure that all the stakeholders involved agree or at least have some consensus on what needs to be done. So suppose you have some uh, requirements, and as you can see here, these need to be verified. So in the last episode, we, we were looking at verify requirements. That's part of your requirement analysis and design definition uh, knowledge area. And here you start, um, well, obtaining agreement on and approval of the requirements and designs you come up with to make sure these are being approved. Everybody agrees on what needs to be done. So, uh, of course, therefore, you uh, need your solution scope. Okay? Your solution scope is one of the guidelines you need to make sure your requirements uh, fit within the scope or don't fit within the scope uh, and uh, are part of your, and what it means for the change strategy you have here. Um, or uh, you may have some legal or regulatory uh, information that you uh, will need to make sure your requirements are approved or not. So I think a very important step to start with uh, to, to make sure everybody agrees on what needs to be done. What's also part of this is, um, of course, everybody um, knows situations in which stakeholders disagree on what needs to be done. So in this 
situation, you may even have some conflicts. And that's a part of our daily jobs as BAs as well to make sure stakeholders are aligned and agree on what needs to be done. Uh, and if that doesn't work, well, you need some kind of conflict resolution to, uh, to do that. So again, uh, we're going to have a look at competencies later, but um, well, the skill set for BAs is, is, is quite big. So you also need uh, people skills to make sure these conflicts are being resolved. So that's part of this uh, knowledge of this, this task as well. So if you show me the next slide, Luke. Yes, uh, we've been looking at this one before. Uh, last episode, the acceptance criteria, this may help to find your approval. So what are we talking about? Um, are we on the same page considering some user story or not? And who uh, has what kind of acceptance criteria? So acceptance criteria may help you to come to um, an agreement to what needs to be done. Uh, may help to find uh, a consensus. So that may mean, uh, well, you start with the the first acceptance criteria and uh, because stakeholder A really needs that in, in the short term and you may do the other ones a little bit later. So if everybody agrees on that, you are uh, doing quite well, I think. And then the next slide you have the consensus workshop. So uh, the, the, the BABOC doesn't mention the consensus workshop. It's mentioned as a workshop, but this is just some kind of, uh, well, some, some kind of workshop you may have. Uh, and this is what you want to do to, uh, to, to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, and uh, ideally, you reach an agreement so everybody is involved and everybody uh, agrees on what needs to be done that's the the thing you really want to accomplish but of course this won't be the case in uh, well in in all situations uh, sometimes you need to compromise and that means you you have a little give and take so uh, everybody uh, will get what he or she wants uh, but uh, maybe it, it will take uh, some more time to, to realize that. And uh, if stakeholders can live with that, that's okay. So it's all about, I think, um, uh, expectation management. Uh, what do stakeholders expect? Uh, what to get? Okay. Uh, the third one is another sub technique that's voting. So you can, that's a democratic process. So everybody, votes what he or she wants and the most votes count in this situation. So that's that's well one uh, tactic you could use to come to uh, uh, resolving requirement conflicts. Uh, you could also choose to define different friends. So if uh, two stakeholders have different opinion, opinions about what needs to be done, uh, you might choose to do both and find out what's the best uh, by, uh, well, do some implementation uh, and even deployment of all these uh, uh, conflicting requirements, if that's possible, of course. And then the last one is overruling. So uh, somebody in charge decides. Um, <clears throat> and of course, in Scrum, that's the product owner. So. The product owner has the final responsibility and even accountability for the product. So, um, of course, uh, as we told you before, uh, product owners are BAs. So a product owner is a special kind of business analyst that has the mandate to, to choose what needs to be done considering some kind of product and information system. So, and of course, uh, this person will talk with his or her stakeholders all the time uh, to make sure what they need. And then the PO will decide what actually will happen uh, in what order also. 
So that's the bridge to the next uh, task. That's prioritizing requirements. So, of course, again, I'll state it again. Um, you may want to start with prioritizing. That's that's OK. And do the approval later. That's fine with me as long as you do it. So uh, the, the Babok says this needs to be done and there's no fixed order to it. So you can see the input here requirements and designs. Um, no special state or anything. These are just requirements that are being uh, found, uh, being specified or modeled uh, that need to be prioritized. So in many cases, this is the easiest one. So you will have some user stories as new requirements. Maybe you can do, go one back, uh, Luke. Um, and um, well, you, you want to prioritize them using some kind of requirement management tool. Uh, Luke mentioned before JIRA. So JIRA is a requirement management tool. You can see as a, a tool on the left side of this picture, and you can start um, documenting your uh, user stories and make sure these are being prioritized. So I have we have a slide on this one later. Uh, and of course, again, here knowledge, the main knowledge is a, a very important one, as are the change strategy and the solution scope, of course. Yeah, and, and then there's, of course, the, the Babok mentions the prioritization as a technique. Um, and there's four groups of prioritization approaches. Uh, the first one is negotiation. So we've been talking a bit uh, about that before. So the, the approval is a lot about negotiation. Um, then you have some stakeholder consensus on the requirement to be prioritized. Um, another good way to do it is budgeting and time boxing. <clears throat> I use that a lot in practice by choosing releases. Um, I help the product owner to to make sure we have the right um, um, releases planned for the next year and uh, make sure all the uh, user stories or epics that are new are being allocated to these releases. So that's one way to do it. Um, you might also use some grouping or uh, well, um, a, a classification of requirements by prioritizing them as high, medium, or low. Uh, and um, well, some sub technique you could use there is the Moscow. So we have a slide on this one later. And uh, well, for agile teams, the, the most popular, I would say, is the ranking technique as a prioritization uh, in which you rank uh, from one to let's say 100 or even 1000. Number one being the, the most important to realize um, and uh, number 100 or 1000 being the least important or, or the least um, urgent one to, to realize. So if you show the next slide, Luke, you will see the Moscow grouping. Well, Moscow is... Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, in these times, uh, with the with the war going on in in Ukraine, um, but it stands for uh, must have, should have, could have, or uh, won't have. And these are typically the the classifications of requirements you may have to find out what's well, what requirements are really needed to make sure the your project project will will succeed or will fail. If you don't realize these requirements, your project will fail. If you meet these requirements, you have a bigger chance by uh, getting some extra money, for instance. Uh, your should have are, of course, also, also important requirements, but these aren't, uh, well, needed to make sure the, the, the project will fail. Uh, then you have could haves that have, well, middle priority, they, they are also being called nice to haves. And then there's low priority and even requirements uh, that stakeholders will say, well, I don't really need it this time. So maybe on the later, but not this time around. 
So what's the problem with the, the Moscow technique is that many stakeholders um, group all their requirements as must have. So that's one of the, well, it's it's a nice first step, but if you all score must haves, <laughs> it's, then uh, you- Yeah, it's a recognized, uh, recognized, I think for all of us who are listening, everything must be done, you know, rather yesterday than tomorrow and everything is important. But I, I, I always say if everything is important, nothing is important. But uh, yeah, it's, I think it's a challenge for every uh, business analyst and product owner uh, owner out there. Yeah, it it w- it could be nice to have some some first step on prioritization. So I use this, uh, but only as a first step. Uh, the the next step will be the the next slide that will be ranking. So ranking, if you show the yeah the the backlog management. So here you see. Um, on the on the bottom you see backlog in the picture that's actually your your product backlog and um the the one on top is the the first one to be realized in the in the next sprint yeah so um you on top you see a, a sprint backlog uh, and on at the bottom you see um a product backlog and the order is uh, very important for your uh, product backlog. So uh, on the left side you see versions. So there's also uh, some uh, releases uh, you can see. So that's what I do first. Uh, we have Apex for um, well, the, all stakeholders will come up with with Apex, and we fill within our team. We fill the uh, Apex. We have different user stories, and we put them on the backlog, and then we put them in um in a in a version in a release to make sure you have um the 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 proper um user stories for the next release let's say you release uh six times a year uh, six times a year and then you have uh, two months time to make sure you have the for instance the 7.10 release in order so uh, if you have sprints of three weeks you will have around three sprints for every release. So first thing to do is, well, what are the epics? What user stories uh, do exist for every epic? And then you can think about how do I allocate all these user stories to all these versions, to all these releases? And this is your release backlog. And this is your, the, the, the list you start with um to make sure you can uh, do some proper um sprint uh, planning meetings yeah and to be able to to find out what's the score you see on the right side that's your uh, your story points we're going to have a look at those later uh, you need to have some elaboration of all these user stories uh, for instance using use case specifications to make sure what's actually meant with this particular user story so uh, this is the 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 traceability you will need for that so you this is your wish list as i always say this is your backlog and you start realizing the 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 backlog by making sure your user stories are being elaborated at a proper way and often you use uh, use cases with that or or um, maybe activity diagrams class diagrams all kinds of diagrams uh, that are part of your requirement analysis and design definition part. So um, later when we look at traceability, um, I will uh, talk about that again. So ranking is all about making sure you do the the, the right things first and uh, show that other things, uh, well, may, uh, may wait a little while. Uh, the next uh, task is, uh, for us at least, is the assessment of requirement changes. So, as uh, Luke told before, um, things won't be the same all the time. Uh, you will have some new uh, wishes. You will have some new changes on what you already have. So, in the picture on the right side, you can see proposed changes. These will be your inputs. And then you need to make sure the there will be some assessment about 
what does this change mean for what we already have? So, and of course, you again uh, will need your solution scope to do that, uh, to make sure your proposed change is part of your solution scope. Uh, does it fit or doesn't does it not fit? Um, how am, are we going to, to do that uh, using the requirement architecture? That was part of the last episode. And of course, domain knowledge is all, always important. Uh, and on the left side, you see um, what happens to potential requirements. So this is actually uh, a picture from the Babok as well. Potential requirements are always being assessed. Um, so think about a group of people who have a first assessment on this potential requirement. So some kind of change you might say, well, that might be uh, considered as a potential requirement as well. So a requirement change is coming in. Um, will, web, will that be brought forward or not? OK, uh, if not, then uh, it might still be a potential requ requirement for the future. If it will be brought forward, then you will need the, the approval or consensus part. If that is the case, then you can start managing them. So this is, well, uh, some kind of order you can have uh, with all these um, tasks of this knowledge area, but this is just an example. And then, uh, yeah, we have relative estimation. So to make sure what the actual assessment is for every job, uh, these are the, the relative estimation. And as you can see on the picture here, as with the um, estimating the height of a building. Uh, these are all, um, well, buildings in, in Rotterdam. Um, uh, you can choose, well, if you know how the high the, the, the tower is on the left side, you might have a good estimation about the height of other buildings. So you compare the height of the building you know with other buildings you want to estimate the height of. And the same is true for, for user stories. So if you know, uh, let's say you had a user story uh, in the past that scored like three points, and you know, well, I have uh, something to do that is about the same size, I score three points as well. Or maybe this a little bit bigger, I score five points. So that's just one way to do it. That's planning poker technique. Uh, use story points for that. You could also use very early in your project t-shirt sizes. So that's small, medium, large, and extra large, or even more categories uh, to have some kind of relative estimation about the size of uh, a, a change that comes in. Uh, so, and there's also the, the WSJF technique, uh, we have a, a separate slide on that one. So this is all about making sure you assess new requirements or new changes to requirements uh, in a proper way. Yeah, planning poker, many people use this, many people know this, so I'll be short on this one. This is based on the row of Fibonacci, and these are actually the numbers you may use from zero to 100 or even the infinite symbol, as you can see. So what this means is that you, once you have a new requirement or you have a change to requirements, you have a team and everybody will throw on uh, one of these cards. So it is actually a poker game. Everybody gets a set of cards and everybody throws a number and that's his or her estimation of the um, the size of the, the work that needs to be done to accomplish this uh, particular story. Uh, so zero is, well, I do it in, uh, in, in five minutes. And 100 is a, is, is a huge user story, often called uh, an epic, that you cannot realize within one sprint. So um, I would say job sizes that are bigger than eight, don't put them in your sprint. So uh, let the cards do the work. So 
everybody puts on a card and for instance one person says well this is a, a small story i say one and another says well no this is an eight they will have a discussion on um, the amount of work that people think that needs to be done and of course uh, you work in a team uh, you have your team responsibility so you must have some uh, team commitment and team consensus so in the end ideally you come up with well maybe um, the person that said one point will say well okay yeah I agree with you it's a bit more work than uh, than I thought I will put on a three or a five and the person who said well eight okay maybe that was a bit too high I put on a three or a, th uh, a five so then you come to a consensus and that will be the um, the estimation for the team. So that's that's the way it works. You have some? Uh, yes, I was about to say, to say that. Yeah. So if, if it's, if it's uh, indeed um, larger uh, user stores, if all of a sudden people indeed do throw in the, the 20, 40 cards, and often that's also a sign where uh, probably looking at, okay, is the uh, story complete? Uh, can you uh, make it smaller, right? So uh, often uh, larger user stores uh, can, can uh, have different components. And if you then, you know, break them up into little more uh, little stories, uh, which have less data po or story points, uh, which is then also e e more easily to digest uh, for both the team, the, pro the development team, uh, and also for, for delivery. Right, so that exactly. is something you could um, you could do. Yeah, so sometimes I get the question, well, uh, with online sessions, how do you do it? Uh, there's yeah. there's tools you exactly. can use for this, um, but you can also use the chat. So what what I do often is just use the chat, your Teams chat or your Skype chat, and uh, everybody fills in the number you can see here and waits to press enter. Uh, because if you do that too fast, you may be, um, well, um, be influenced by the, the, the number uh, of somebody else. So uh, the, the really important that you have your own estimation because you are, um, well, a team member and you are being listened to uh, with all the, uh, the experience you have and all the maybe doubts you have considering this particular story. A very important one, I think. OK, then there's the WSJF. This, <laughs> yeah, this um, one is, uh, this one is, uh, this was also, also even a new one for me. OK, yeah, great. Uh, this is this is uh, one that's being used in SAFE, so the, the scaled agile framework. Um, and this is, uh, well, a, a, a quite an easy formula, as you can see, the cost of delay divided by the job duration. Um, well, this is being used by comparing different jobs, by dividing the cost by the time it takes to do the job. And that's what you see in the formula. And as you can understand, you want the cost of delay to be as low as possible. And on the other hand, you want to do the job jobs that don't take too much time first. And this is why these factors are part of the form, uh, formula. So let's have a look at this example and see what it means. Uh, well, as you, can, uh, as you can see, job B has the highest WSJF because it only takes one day to realize it and it saves the company five grand after it has been realized. So that's the COD part. And you divide them so that scores five, the other scores two and uh, 0.2. OK, so um, the picture on the bottom, if you click on the next one, yeah, here you can see that um, when you start with job B, there will only be one day. The total, uh, the co total cost of delay will be 16 grand. And after that day, um, job B has been realized and the COD will be 11 grand for the next five days. And after another five days, there will be only one grand left. So the WSJF tells us to choose the right order to realize the work to be done. And choosing another order would cost the company more money. 
So that is, I think, a very good way to compare cost of delay with your job duration and actually a quite easy formula to make sure you do the 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 proper jobs uh, in the right order. I think the only challenge is probably to get how, how do you get to that cost ex That's aspect. true. Uh, I think duration That's you true. could probably do with the development team. You can say, okay, uh, so that also probably then requires a bit more effort from either the business analyst or the product owner to then also identify, okay, what is actually um, the benefit uh, of, of doing this from a, from a exactly. cost. Exactly. Uh, well, this this will take time. As this is typically uh, what they call metrics. So metrics is all about this, uh, um, and and it takes time to come up with your with with a proper set of metrics. So uh, what does it cost when we when we don't do this? Yeah, that will take some time. Just as it will take time to to do the the, the right estimation with planning poker sessions. Yeah, it's a learning uh, curve. Huh? That's, that's also maybe important to to highlight. It's not a uh, fixed mathematics. Exactly. Where you, well you go. Uh, huh? So if one sprint you realize, oh uh, shit, we have now way too much story points, uh, or we we can or we don't make it. Uh, so you know, then during the retros, I use the retros to then identify, okay, where did we go wrong? From maybe sizing, did we not use the right? Um, exactly. comparison tickets to actually uh, put the right story points against it. So don't push yourself too hard for the first time right. Uh, it's a yes. learning curve. Exactly. That's that's what I meant earlier with the the the, the slide that showed the, the strategy, the initiative and the, the delivery. You have these feedback loops. Well, this is what it's all about. Learn as you go and never stop learning. Uh, I think this is a very important part of, of business analysis and making sure that your, your organization becomes uh, better and better. So to me, it's an, it's an important part. Traceability. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do uh, requirements and designs uh, align to one another? So uh, the last task we were looking at was assess changes how can you assess uh, a change properly when requirements are not related to each other? It, it will be much easier when you relate requirements to each other to make sure um, what impact a change will have. So this actually is properly uh, probably why this is 5.1. So make sure you align all your requirements first and your designs. Yeah, I th I agree on that one. Um, so um, important part of requirement lifecycle management. Um, uh, if kijk, uh, we have um, yeah requirement lifecycle management tools of re requirement management tools are a very important part of this one as well. So I'll show you in a minute that um, that you can use tools to do that. Um, traceability, well, there's two kinds of traceability. Uh, there's vertical traceability. Um, well, we talked about that in last episode when it was about um, validating requirements so validating requirements is all about the alignment between solution requirements and uh, why they are needed so what's the actual value of a solution requirement to stakeholders and to your business and even to your business needs so the alignment is what you do with a vertical traceability and then there's also a horizontal traceability so the horizontal traceability is all about, well, what do we need as uh, the, the product to do? So what are the, the, the product features and how do we elaborate these product features? Uh, uh, what are the detailed requirements to do that? And what even what designs um, are related to what requirements and even the code, as you can see. So everything needs to be aligned to make sure you can uh, do a, a proper estimation of the change uh, 
uh, once a change comes in. So I think a very important part. Uh, how uh, can you make sure you have traceability? Well, you can use matrix to do that. And as the rows, you can see the user stories numbered from US 01 to US 08. Uh, these are actually the new wishes that come in. And these may be elaborated using different use cases. So what this matrix tells you is that user story one to three um, are all about uh, use case one. So the elaboration of these three user stories uh, will be done doing uh, the elaboration of use case number one. Um, well, that's that's what this says. And uh, lately I've been using an other way to make sure there's a traceability. Maybe you can show the next slide. And that's using Jira. So here on the, uh, the, 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 the picture you see on top is a Jira list. So these are all user stories. The part on the right side uh, is your uh, is one of the stories. And as you can see in description, there is some hyperlink um, that if you click on the hyperlink, you will see your Confluence page in which you elaborate your use cases. So this is what traceability is all about. So use hyperlinks, use tooling, use requirement model uh, modeling tools, or requirement management tools, I need to say, to make sure what needs to be done next and also what that means for your existing uh, requirement documents, which are also requirements. So the one on top are requirements. These are new wishes and the one at the bottom are your elaborations of your requirements. And these are all your more detailed requirements. So everybody knows what's going on. Uh, I think BA plays a very important part in that one. That's part of the requirement analysis and design definition. So you specify and model task. Um, and with this, you relate them to each other. Uh, and also you have backward traceability. So you have forward. So where does user story go to and backward? Uh, what is an adjustment to uh, a, a use case description? Where uh, did it start? What's the source of this particular adjustment to your use case descriptions? And that's your backward traceability. So okay. you can also always find uh, adjustment in your use case descriptions and why uh, an adjustment has been done over time. So your yeah, Jira yeah. is your wish list and your Confluence uh, is, um, is also Atlassian, is your requirement elaboration environment uh, slash requirement documentation uh, um, environment. Yeah, exactly. Often uh, you get the question like, okay, should I put everything in the tickets, uh, all the information, but indeed, no, that's not uh, the place where you want to put all the information. The ticket should briefly describe indeed the user story, uh, often uh, acceptance criteria. Um, uh, so it's all about documenting that is what is important for the development team to know, but then uh, indeed the whole uh, process of how you got there. Uh, which is really also part of what you already described in planning your BA activities and uh, what tools are we going to use? How are we going to uh, uh, indeed uh, what what kind of, uh, um, I don't know, uh, unique identifiers are we going to use? Uh, which are uh, your requirements, uh, uh, um, the, the way, how, what are the requirements for getting gathering your requirements? So it has a unique identifier. Uh, so then you can trace back that unique identifier to indeed a page on a confluence where you have more docu documentation, uh, maybe you know also some documents with with uh, which which have important information. Uh, so really, again, let the tools also really work for you. Uh, choose the right tools, but then again, also make sure that you set up the right the tools in a way that it's really helping you. Uh, so exactly. a lot of people don't know that Jira is actually uh, and confluence can be very flexible. Uh, people use it out of the box, but you can really, you know, set your your own processes. You can set your own uh, uh, fields. Uh, you know, everything you want to track or want to keep track of, you can 
can basically uh, uh, get get there. So really let the tools work for you because doing this yep. all from the top of your head, it's impossible. Exactly. And even in Jira, you can have your source. Eh? So who is the source of a requirement? You can fill that in because it's one of the attributes for every story. And you can even uh, have, um, for instance, a mail. Uh, for instance, you get uh, a new wish coming in by mail. And you can even relate to, to this particular mail uh, by, by using hyperlinks. So I think it's, it's very powerful to make sure you can navigate through your, well, your whole uh, requirement management tools to find out what, uh, what a requirement is, where it comes from and where it goes to. Uh, the last one is all about maintenance. So as long as your uh, product exists, you will have maintenance on your requirements. So, uh, well, these are again uh, uh, requirements. So uh, you have an existing system and new requirements keep on coming in because your, uh, your stakeholders will may have new wishes. And so that means you need to adjust your requirements and your designs. Okay, so that's that's what you do here to retain requirement accuracy and consistency throughout and beyond the change during the entire requirement life cycle, and to make sure that you support reuse of uh, requirements in other solutions. So also important. Um, yeah, I think this is a, this, this picture shows you that, uh, for user story one, you may just have a very simple, happy flow. Uh, so your activity diagram, uh, that's your elaboration of your user story, uh, might look, uh, the, like the, the, the picture you see on the left. Okay. And maybe some sprint later in the next sprint or even later. Uh, a new wish comes in and that means your uh, activity diagram will change. So in your confluence environment, you will have to adjust your, uh, your picture. Um, and that's what you see in the middle. And even later uh, you will have, uh, the, the middle one is uh, of course uh, might be an alternative flow. So you don't have <clears throat> the perfect situation. Uh, I, I want to advise you start, <clears throat> start with a, a very easy um, picture. Uh, make, do, don't make it too, too difficult in the first place and add new uh, complexity as you go. That's also your feedback loops. So you learn as you go and you add new wishes to your list. And these new wishes will lead to adjustments to what you already have. And that you see on the right side, there's even a, a new insight in your happy flow. And that's uh, why you need to adjust your, your pictures all the time. So that's what you do as a BA, uh, adjustments, uh, as long as your product exists, they change with time, both your requirements and your designs. Um, yeah, we we looked at this in the last episode. That's, that's the basic flow. So you can have a use case model on the on the right, a use case diagram, um, and you can elaborate this use case using a use case description and uh, we do a, another episode on this particular technique i think luke um, and as you go you may have um, a new wish uh, so you, you started with a, a version that has just the basic flow to it and then somebody says well i also need to know what will happen when there's no room available in this particular situation Okay, elaborate that. Uh, 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 put it on your backlog. Make sure this is being prioritized. And once it becomes more uh, more urgent, and when it's one of the top uh, priorities, then you can start elaborating your um, your alternative scenario, as you can see here. Uh, and that's your adjustment to your 
uh, your, your confluence environment. So things change with time. Yeah, bringing us already um, well nicely on top of the hour to the um, to the to the summary of what uh, what we've been discussing. I think a uh, lot lot of content, right? So five uh, five tasks. It's always uh, hard to put that uh, in one hour. We try to kind of touch every topic, give you some practical examples, some techniques to you know to take away and to start putting into practice. Uh, uh, in your in your daily lives, uh, but again, of course, uh, uh, we would always advise you to go in and maybe you know purchase the Babok or uh, start doing a training to really get into the details of these specific uh, specific tasks. But I hope we have given you a good, nice overview of chapter seven. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, chapter five, uh, which uh, for our session uh, was seven uh, session seven, uh, where we talked about tracing requirements maintaining requirements, prioritizing them, assess the changes and have them approved. Um, so yeah, I think that brings us to the uh, to the end of this uh, of this show. Up next, we will uh, have our solution evaluation session. Um, yeah, so talking about how do we actually assess the outcome of what you have built. Uh, 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 this is the moment where you will probably get a lot of feedback from stakeholders, uh, users, uh, and, and see whether uh, did it actually achieved that uh, what you have set at the beginning of the uh, when you set the objectives of the um, of what the yep. product should realize. Yeah, so, and you can use it also as uh, some kind of pilot. So if you want to, uh, for instance, uh, buy some piece of software, you might uh, you might use the solution evaluation. Uh, knowledge area to to make sure you 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 choose the right option. So that's also part of that uh, knowledge area. Very yeah, interesting. So also, I hope you uh, will be listening in uh, either live or otherwise virtually on YouTube uh, for our next session. So we will post this uh, episode uh, the weekend that is following uh, us, uh, which is the uh, what is it twenty. 1st of May, we will put this uh, on YouTube so everybody who is listening in remotely in their own time and different time zones even because in the meanwhile we have a lot of engagement with many of you where you know want to you know keep keep doing that right ask your questions uh, engage with us if there's anything that uh, you know you would like to learn more about you know let's 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 make it an active community and help each other as well so yeah Thank you again. And, for and, and, may, and maybe also nice, just fill in uh, maybe some subjects you, you need to be discussed. So yeah. uh, we can look on that one as well. So exactly. Uh, feel free to, to give your topics of interest. Uh, so we are soon approaching the end of this series, which uh, we already have a lot of ideas for next series. But your input is really valuable so that we can also tailor it to what our listeners want to you know, learn more about. So uh, again, thank you very much for engaging with us for your time. We will uh, yeah, speak soon again and enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of the week. Bye-bye. See you next time.